Welcome once again to another edition of Digging the Details with Jim and Dean. And I'd like to introduce the Dean half of that credit. He's a writer, an artist, and a Disney historian. He's Dean Brinkerhoff. Thank you, Jim. And now I'll introduce the Jim half of our presentation. Jim Fanning is a renowned author and YouTube sensation, blogger, Disney historian and enthusiast, and it's an uh, honor to be with you today talking about what we have in store for you and digging the details today. Thank you, Nico. And today we're going to be talking about a non-Disney subject, but something that we both definitely dig, and that's the MGM film The Wizard of Oz. Dean, why don't you fill in the few people that don't know what The Wizard of Oz is on what it is? The Wizard of Oz is a film released in 1939 on August 25th of that year. It's a classic that many people revere and love as some of their favorite of any film. It's a renowned family film that many people consider a great classic and one that's a favorite book to film adaptation and features a great cast and wonderful songs. And it's certainly a film that I grew up with and loved and cherish and it's a beautiful musical beautiful sometimes comedy sometimes drama it has it all it really does and the film is celebrating its anniversary this month so we'd love to share some details with you about it you're certainly right dean it's everybody knows that this film is one of the most acclaimed of all time and it's interesting i was looking at some of the uh coverage of the release in 1939 and even then they were saying this may be one of the greatest films ever made and i do think it's a tremendous work of cinema uh, and just one of those films where everything comes together so beautifully so perfectly if ever there was a perfect film this is it and it's certainly one of my favorites it may even be my favorite film of all time uh, probably Mary Poppins is at the top of my list because the the Disney aspect puts it puts it over the top. <laughs> but this would certainly be number two. So here we are doing kind of a television show about The Wizard of Oz. Famously, it was a, an annual treat for decades before the advent of home entertainment and streaming and everything else. Now you can watch The Wizard of Oz whenever you want. You can turn us off and turn it on right now, but please don't do that. <laughs> Stay with us. But I, but uh, when it was originally on CBS, CBS had the tradition of having a host. So uh, some years it was hosted by Danny Kay. Dick Van Dyke hosted it with his children. Red Skelton hosted it with his daughter. A number of CBS stars, they were always CBS stars, hosted wow. it. But for the very first screening on CBS, I wonder if you could guess who hosted that showing. And they were not CBS stars. They were not CBS stars. I'll just throw a wild guess out there, Mickey Rooney. You're close. You're close. <laughs> Liza Minnelli, who is, of course, Judy Garland's daughter, and she was just a little girl then, and Bert Lahr. Wow. Who, who, for people that don't know, played the Cowardly Lion. So what a great way to kick it all off. What an, what an amazing thing that must have been to have seen. Yeah, so, no kidding. So... In order to help us dig some of the details of this vast subject of The Wizard of Oz, I'm going to unbox this Blu-ray set that I've had for some time that's never been opened. <laughs> and it has quite a few treats in it. Um, and I believe it's the 75th anniversary, so that was 2014, and that was a while ago now. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, so it's about time I opened this, probably. Um, but I thought we would do it together, and then maybe we can talk a little bit more about the film as we go on. I'm so excited to see what's in that. That's awesome. <laughs> so, 
Now, as I open this up, I'll remind our viewers that one of the first videos that I did on Told You With TV, it w was uh, a video about Off to See the Wizard, the animated series that was inspired by the MGM film. And I did show this Blu-ray set on that video. So if you haven't seen that video, take a look after you watch this one. <laughs> But, but of course, I didn't open it. So now we're opening it. And it's very now inside. Yes, it's like, it's like a treasure chest. It has this kind of cool wraparound with the blue for Blu-ray. And this is interesting because it's a Blu-ray 3D. They released The Wizard of Oz to the theaters in the 3D process. Now, I didn't see that, but some friends of mine did. And they said it was it looked absolutely amazing in 3D. Wow. So, so first of all, we have this wonderful art on the front with kind of this glowing effect. Is that lenticular or is it kind of a glossy reflection-y? I don't know how I, to say that. I think it is more like a use of reflections, like a reflective material. But... I'm not sure. <laughs> Still beautiful. Yeah, it is. And um, it's really wonderful to see Glinda on the cover because she's not, she's not usually featured. So they obviously thought, let's do this particular lovely moment where Dorothy is using the ruby slippers to return home. And Glinda's wand is what's kind of has that effect. So a really great idea and of course we have the the three great the three good friends there as well okay, cheering her on and dorothy's <laughs> right and dorothy's holding toto so toto too i'll hold this up so we can see this is like a slip cover i guess you would say and then we have this ribbon that helps us take the book out. So we have this hardcover book. Very cool. It really is. What's inside? Beautifully designed. It's always best to start at the beginning, it says. Yeah. <laughs> it's called a timeline, so it's in the form of a timeline down here all the way through the book. Neat. So it starts with January 31st, 1938. Future MGM producer Arthur Freed submits casting recommendations to studio chief Louis B. Mayer. MGM announces on February 24th, 1938, that Judy Garland has been cast in the lead role of Dorothy. So right there, as you look at this beautiful photo of the characters at the poppy field, I'll say that one of the myths of the associated with the film is that Shirley Temple was intended to play Dorothy. And it's made to sound like that Judy Garland was the second choice. But quite the opposite is true. The Shirley Temple thing was a, was a momentary reflection. <laughs> Shirley Temple was a huge box office star. Yeah. Judy Garland was not at that time. This is the movie that made her a star. But right. but it's so it's not unusual that they would stop and think maybe for for a time about Shirley Temple because she was closer to the age that Dorothy's supposed to be in the book in the book in the yeah. original book by L. Frank Baum as I know you know Dean she's a very she's a little girl Judy Garland portrays her more as a twelve year old so Shirley Temple would be more probably what people think of as Dorothy before this movie <laughs> but it was a momentary thing and Shirley Temple was a, a 20th century Fox star there would have been great complications in getting her into Shirley Temple, the role certainly would be an interesting thing to think about or consider what if that happens in an alternate universe or whatever but I, I'm pretty happy with Judy Garland myself <laughs> well they and and the way that especially Arthur Freed who was her champion from the start, was envisioning this movie is that it had a depth and uh, a musical sophistication that as wonderful as Shirley Temple was, 
as a performer, yeah, she would please. not she would not have been able to achieve. Judy Garland brings an acting depth, let alone her her musical talent. So that's all we have to say. So the book goes on and on. We don't have time to look at the whole thing, unfortunately. But all the way along, it has all these dates. November 5th, 1938. A packed bus leaves New York City carrying 30 munchkins to be. <laughs> and let me just skip forward a little bit just so we can see something else. February 1st, 1939. Contract player... Clara Blandick, announced by MGM as Aunt M. So it gives you all these dates about the casting all the way through, plus these incredible photos. Some of those probably are really never before seen. That's really cool. Right, and to jump to the happy ending, as it were, but the happy endings never stop for Oz. Here we have Mickey Rooney, who you mentioned, presenting Judy Garland with her special juvenile oscar for best juvenile performance as dorothy so that's a beautiful and lovely photo that's very sweet. very sweet indeed so we also have these re this really cool map <laughs> of the land of oz wow and i just i just love that the marvelous map of oz and all these wonderful little details here we have Nico, who's the winged monkey. They put these little icons down here. The ruby slippers, Toto, and then uh, a compass to show you which way is which. And it's important for the witches of Oz to know which is north and south and west. <laughs> or east. Right. And it shows some of the details that are not in the movie that are from the original book. So we have Quadling Land here as well as some of the lands you do see in the film. So it's really neat how they incorporated other details from the original book. Then we have this beautiful print of Dorothy on the, on the bridge over the little stream in Munchkin Land, which she never walks across in the film. So that's really neat to see. Now this, I believe, this is another book, and I believe this is a journal. So you can write all your Aussian dreams what would you write down in the journal, Jim? I think I would write down some of the wonderful facts associated with the film as they come to me. Because there's so many. It has such a storied history. And like I said, there, the happy ending was the great success of the film. A great critical success, a great box office success. But then it went on to great success on TV and lives on a, as a beloved film. Another myth about the movie is that it was a financial flop and that the critics didn't like it. That's not true. Quite the opposite. The critics loved it, most of them. And it did actually sell a great many tickets, but it was so expensive. It was undoubtedly the most expensive movie that had ever been made. Gone with the Wind was being made at the same time, so that perhaps was more expensive. But... The Wizard of Oz was certainly way up there in terms of cost, that it couldn't make its money back. It wasn't until the re-release after uh, Meet Me in St. Louis that I think they re-released it. So wow. again, it had a great success in the movie theaters, as a Disney, as a la the Disney films that were re released to theaters again after their original run, and then it made its money back. Well, considering all the special effects and everything involved in the film and the elaborate sets, I believe it 100% that it was expensive, but I am glad that it made its money back. <laughs> and more, I'm sure. <laughs> and more, exactly. To look at some of the artifacts that are in the box, probably should, sh I don't know if I really showed it, because they are displayed quite nicely. I like that cover. That's cool. It really is. So now that you brought that up, here is the Blu-ray itself with all the extras, including the 3D version. And it contains, of course, the regular 2D version of the film as well, plus plenty of extras. So you're right. That is a great cover. I think I talked about a few of these extras in that original video that I had done, but now we're seeing them. This is a deluxe award pin set, as they call it. So these are the artifacts that the wizard gave to the three friends 
to represent the gifts that they were seeking, the diploma to represent a brain, the heart-shaped clock that represents the heart, and the Medal of Valor to represent courage. So how cool are those pins? Wow. Pretty neat and very fitting for the film. Lovely, and this great box. And then we have a ruby slipper sparkler globe, as they call it. So it's uh -oh. kind of... <laughs> It's kind of taking off of the crystal ball in the film, and then the ruby slippers are on top. So, you know, it's 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 cool, and it, and it says, try me. I don't know what it's supposed to do. Look at that. It's like it lights up or something. Yeah. And it's a snow globe, which, of course, is great for the, for the snowfall that Glinda sends to revive Dorothy and her friends at, at, in the poppy field. So we definitely have some wonderful artifacts in this great Blu-ray set. And I think you have some uh, some things of your own to show. Yeah, I don't have quite a cool set as you do, but I do have the 70th anniversary Blu-ray set, which includes three discs of the film and some bonus features. No 3D version, sadly, but... <laughs> We do have some retrospective documentaries and we have um, some commentary and publicity items such as the posters and trailers. And on the third disc actually is included the MGM documentary, When the Lion Roars, which is a six hour in depth look at the award winning studio chronicle of MGM. So definitely is a neat thing to have on this set. It's a three disc Emerald edition, nice cover. Minus Glinda and uh, her beautiful wand, but we do have the main cast of characters on their journey, and including Toto. And on the back, we've got some art of the ruby slippers that come to Dorothy, and it's in a slip cover with the same art, but still really neat and pretty in depth as far as uh, bonus features. Uh, special edition set goes and I really appreciate and treasure that stuff I definitely love the extras <laughs> as do I they yeah. when they're well done they give you so much to enhance your appreciation of the film you mentioned the cover and that Glinda isn't on it and you're right but the wizard is so that's cool they they thought to include him. So I like the different variations over the years. And they, you, can yeah. tell, you can tell they put a lot of thought into it and a lot, of, a lot of care. Dean, you had mentioned the commentaries. One commentary that's been featured on several editions over the years has been the commentary by John Fricke. He is the leading authority on The Wizard of Oz, and not only The Wizard of Oz, but Judy Garland. And wow. he is always a delight. And I know I've mentioned this on Facebook several times. Whenever you see an audio commentary by John Fricke, or if he's included in a documentary, or sometimes Turner Classic Movies shows little interstitials with him talking, drop everything and listen to him, because he is not only the most knowledgeable of historians, but also an excellent presenter. And he's very friendly and accessible and comes across that way. So I can never say enough about John Fricke. And if you have not heard the Wizard of Oz audio commentary, it is a masterclass in this amazing film. And he also debunks some of the myths uh, that are associ associated with the film. Uh, There's a few of those, aren't there? Uh, yes. <laughs> So, Dean, do you have a favorite character from The Wizard of Oz? You know, I have always loved the Tin Man. I've always been fascinated with just how he operates and how he works. And, oh, Jack Haley's performance is incredible as he's coming back to life um, through the oil can and moving his body. I've always thought that he was really neat as far as his performance and just a neat character searching for some of the most, or one of the most pure things, finding, you know, his heart and 
his love for everybody and he's just a very neat character in my opinion he's very a pure character genuine and he wants to only help his friends and uh save the world in the process from the <laughs> wicked whip so <laughs> I would definitely say he's probably my favorite. How about you, Jim? Who's your favorite character? Well, I was afraid you were going to say that because it's so hard to choose. It is hard. Every one of the characters from the largest part to the smallest is so beautifully cast and played and written. So it's definitely. so hard to say. But probably Dorothy, because she brings us back to the roots of the Wizard of Oz book which of course is really called the wonderful wizard of oz again by l frank baum he really set out to write an american fairy tale it was published in 1900 so the united states was still a very young country i mean it still is compared to the european countries from where we got all fairy tales until right. this one and he set out to make a very specific American fairy tale and, and greatly succeeded. And I think Dorothy is one of the reasons because she's, she's a very American character. She's very simple, but as, as befitting because she's a young child, but she's also practical. She is kind of a, she has kind of a can do attitude. Her primary characteristic, especially in the movie the movie version of Dorothy really brings this out, is she is compassionate. She is other-oriented. So even though she's the one that's stuck in this strange land and wants to go back home, she constantly thinks about other people. She constantly attempts to help others. So as she meets each of the three friends, her compassion incorporates them into this little community that she's forming. And that's what, that's what the movie really becomes about. When the wizard gives those three awards, quote unquote, to her friends, she's thrilled. She is, she is delighted. And it's the scarecrow who has to say, wait a minute, what about Dorothy? What about right. what she wanted? She never even stops to think about that. And another, another great moment is where the cowardly lion who's afraid of everything is terrified by the wizard and he faints and Dorothy's having none of this, even though the, the wizard is a, a terrifying figure, she stands up to him and says, how dare you frighten him like that when he's come to you for help. So That's so true. Getting choked up. <laughs> <laughs> so I, very touching. so I've often thought for any parent, Dorothy is a great role model because she's a real, she's a character that's a real child and yet she's unselfish. So that's a wonderful thing to be able to present to your own children and indeed to all of us. She's a role model for all of us and yeah. especially is beautifully portrayed by Judy Garland. There's moment after moment, large and small, where she shows her compassion and her care. Again, a very, a very tiny moment is when they're entering the dark forest where the lion is and the Tin Man warns them that there's going to be wild animals and the scarecrow says, scarecrow's frightened and says, animals that eat straw? And Dorothy like kind of gasps and reaches out and it's such a beautiful little touch that she touches him and as if to like protect him and say, oh, you're poor straw. We can't let that happen to you. Wow, that's a detail that I don't even think I've picked up on despite watching it all my life. That's going to be something fun to look for next time I watch it. I did want to respond to how beautiful it is, I think, that you chose the Tin Man. He's such a heartfelt character, which of course is an iron, both an irony and the point. Yeah, is that he's the one searching for heart. He's the most heartfelt character, and of course that's the point. The gifts that they seek, they already have within them. Definitely. And another incredible thing is that Baum, in his progressiveness, makes 
the females, the, the powerful characters. Oz is a, not a patriarchy, but a matriarchy. All the powerful leaders are women. Now you, now some people might say, well, what about the wizard? The whole story is named after him. But of course we find out that the wizard is a fraud. All the leaders who have power, who have actual power are women. Dorothy herself, of course, is a female. So what an incredible thing to be able to present if you have daughters, or even yeah. if you don't, even if you don't. <laughs> and I find that quite American as well, because of course we look at each other as equals in in this land of ours. And this also came out of the suffragette m movement, because. Baum's wife, and especially his mother-in-law, were very progressive female leaders and, uh, and suffragettes. So this is something new. This is something that we have not seen before. Uh, and it's, when we, you really stop and think about it, it's mind-blowing. And then to tie it all together, I would say that the primary thing about Dorothy is that she is, and this, this is paired with her compassion, she is a healer. She meets three broken men, and because of her, they are healed. They are made whole. And it can even be said that it could even be said about the wizard because he is finally released from this great falsehood that he's built around himself. He's finally released to it. We don't really find out what happens to him, but <laughs> he's certainly able to now fly free. The truth has set him free. This is all due to Dorothy. And of course she liberates two entire communities. Yeah. Because the, wicked, because the Wicked Witch of the East has enslaved the Munchkins and the Wicked Witch of the West has enslaved the Winkies. And she, uh, Dorothy releases them just because of who she is, you could say. Even the, to go back to her compassion, even the act of melting the Wicked Witch in the movie is an act of compassion because the witch has set the scarecrow on fire. So to rescue him, to save him, Dorothy throws the bucket of water. In the book, that's not what happens. She, she just becomes angry at the witch for wanting to steal her, in the, in the book, silver shoes, not ruby slippers. Oh. And gets so angry that she tosses the, the bucket of water on the witch. So then the movie, it's, it's even more powerful because, again, it's an other-oriented thing. And it's an accident. You know, she even says, I didn't mean to melt her. It, it was an accident. Perhaps it's sacrilege to say such a thing, but I think the movie version is better <laughs> if I had to pick. Yes, and I would agree with you. It's not, I don't think it is sacrilege. I think there's many examples of that in sort of the realm that we like to be in. I would say right. I would say Walt Disney's Pinocchio and Mary Poppins are superior to the books that they are based on. And I think it also has something to do with that they are musicals. And to go back to The Wizard of Oz, it's a musical. A musical in itself is a crystallization. Kind of encompass, it encompasses, no, it telescopes things together in song. And that's what you have to do anyhow in a movie, because unless it's going to be, you know, 12 hours long, you can't have it represent everything that's in the book. A lot of things has to be, have to be left out. And everything that the MGM team added to The Wizard of Oz, I agree with you, made the story stronger, even stronger, uh, in a crystallized way. In an, in, yeah. a, in an essence way. So even though we don't get to see all the adventures these characters had in the, that, that we see in the book, it's it, that crystallization makes it incredibly concentrated and strong. So that's I think that is one reason.
those insights add so many layers and deep meaning to the film as a whole, Jim, and those, um, those pieces of context of how the story was created is very interesting. And I love what you said about how it's the, the women who are the leaders. And it's a very powerful American fairy tale. That's so true. <laughs> Earlier, you'd mentioned John Fricke, and to tie into his collaborations and his historical knowledge, he helped create this wonderful book that I have, along with Jay Scarfoni and William Stillman. It's the official 50th anniversary pictorial book of The Wizard of Oz, and it's a wonderful history full of lots of uh, behind-the-scenes photos and probably similar to the book that's included with your with your uh, DVD Blu-ray set. Um, just lots of neat tidbits. There's some Wizard of Oz Valentines, and there's lots of posters, and even some comics and anecdotes and merchandise. And <laughs> it's a really neat comprehensive history of the film. I actually got this pretty recently and I'm excited to delve right into it and learn some more. Thank you for sharing that book with us because it is one of the best histories of Oz that has ever been written. And in fact, it was a huge jump forward for the 50th anniversary in Oz scholarship because until then there certainly had been, you know, books published, but especially with John Fricke's involvement, it really presented all kinds of new information and a lot of photos that had never been seen. They were very wise to present this book with a timeline because obviously the book that was featured with this set couldn't be a huge, you know, 500 page book. So by, I, by choosing to tell it as a timeline that really narrowed it down, but still gave lots of details. That book you have presents a munchkin land full of information and, and scholarship really, but that's very, very, fun to read and beautifully written and beautifully presented. So I envy you reading it. I'll, I might have to pull out my copy and read it again. That sounds like a fun thing to do. <laughs> so in this unboxing of Oz, we've attempted to start talking about a few of the details that we like to dig about the Wizard of Oz, but there's so much more that I'm sure we are going to be revisiting the subject again. As, a lot to chew on here, that's for sure. And as you've heard, it's a favorite subject of Dean's and mine, and I'm sure of yours. And don't forget, you can find both Jim and I on uh, various forms of social media. We usually typically use Instagram, Facebook, and if various other social media that we'll put links to here in the description. And of course, you'll find us on YouTube, uh, here in Toggywood TV. And we hope that you'll tune in again for another edition of Digging the Details. So until then, he's Dean. And he's Jim. And we'll see you next time on Digging the Details.